all of a sudden, everyone is talking about AI or artificial intelligence, especially in the music space. Is it going to help usher in a new era of creation or destroy the industry? Lots of opinions on all sides, but on this episode, we're going to talk about what it is and how you can put it to work for you. You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY. DIY. Oh. Musician. Musician. Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 328 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin Bruner, and joining me is Chris Robley. Chris, how are you? You, you look like you've been working out like shoveling what, a lot of do stuff I look like i was outside because my hair is just slightly sweaty and i've got yeah so maine has been having a very mild winter it's been lovely and uh in the past week we've had three huge snowstorms and i'm sick of it already you know the first one's like oh snow's nice and beautiful and i think at this point i've probably shoveled like 36 inches of snow out of my driveway um uh, which per pertaining to the topic of this episode wouldn't it be nice if there was a self-driving snowplow <laughs> that knew when it snowed, you know, a sufficient amount that you don't want to go out yourself and shovel. And it just comes to your house and does it. Yeah. You know, well, they, I keep seeing those robotic dogs. They keep pulling out every <laughs> once in a while that are just terrifying. Yeah. When I see those coming down the street, I'm going to run because that's just, that's the end right there. But, but if a whole, uh, what do you call a, a gang of dogs, a, um, a pack, Pack. The whole pack of dogs, a robotic dog showed up with little shovels and uh, that's true. Drugs, that'd be it would that, turn that's terrifying true. to cute. If you saw the book of Boba Fett, which I don't know if many people listening to this podcast did, <laughs> robots built rebuilt the Jedi Temple. Oh, in that, that's of them. That was, yes, it was. Uh, that, speaking that, of that, that's robots. what it made me think of. I'm sorry, wrong podcast. <laughs> You know, you brought up the robot dogs, and since we're talking about AI, have you seen the Black Mirror episode with those those robot dogs? I have not. Oh, it's good and I'll, terrifying. I'll have, to, I'll have to go watch that. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about AI in music. Uh, Chris, it's one of those things that has been discussed for a long time and uh, pops up every now and again. But suddenly, at the end, it was like at the end of 2022, everything was about AI and talking about AI. And so in this episode, we're going to we're going to dive into that some and unpack it a little bit so you can understand what you as an artist need to know and what the opportunities are and maybe some things to be concerned about, because there are a lot of people that are concerned. Um, before that, I want to remind you to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to this podcast. Many of you listen to it on the Apple podcast app. Or if you listen on Spotify or Amazon Music, just be sure you're subscribed. It's on YouTube as well. And if you watch on YouTube, oftentimes there are visuals, but just make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And so today we've got, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, AI in music. We've got some uh, phone calls and some email. And while you're listening to this episode, if you've got questions or comments or concerns about AI in music and what the implications are, we absolutely want to hear from you. Uh, you can call our listener line at 360-524-2209, or you can email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. You can also email a WAV file or an MP3 file of your own comments on a microphone. Some of you have done that. Just keep it uh, you know, brief, like three minutes or less is appreciated. Um, but I'm curious to see if people are already using AI, what their thoughts are. Maybe someone will send us an AI generated phone call. <laughs> that Ooh, should be fun. That, you've put the, the prompt out there into the universe. Yeah, I put it out there. Uh, but before we get into all that, Chris, I, I maybe thought maybe we'll balance out what some may think is a depressing episode <laughs> with, with some, uh, I don't know, maybe some inspiration both you and I had been talking about like at the end of the year, like I've just been feeling like in a rut. We've talked about on the podcast, feeling like a uh, creative rut. And I felt like a couple weeks ago, I finally snapped out of it, turned the creative juices back on and got back excited about uh, music and work and all sorts of stuff. And I just had a couple quick notes about it, what, what I did and what I thought would be helpful to pass along. Is that, is that okay if I, I share bet, that? Th yeah. And then, um, I'm going to listen closely because I have a uh, 
what's a, a suspicion about why those creative juices got flowing again. So I'll see if you mention it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I, I thought, okay, start by making a list of all your successes and accomplishments, big or small, and that you've had to date. And partly because a music career is naturally filled with so much rejection moments that it's easy to forget everything. You know, uh, all the successes get clouded out by just ongoing rejection. Um, that's a part of the gig. That, that's a part of it. And it's not like everything's rejection, but there's just enough of it in the day-to-day -day workflow that it can be a bummer. So you got to make a list of all your successes. Then two, identify the exact time and places in your career where you felt like you were in an amazing creative flow. What environment were you in? What, what was a specific rehearsal room, recording studio, place at school? Uh, you know, any, was it a specific time or a place? Kind of think about that. And then uh, if it's possible, um, physically go to one of those places and step foot into that space again. And my specific example was, um, Chris, I even messaged you when I was there because I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this brought back so much. Uh, for a while, like at the early days of this podcast and when CD Baby was really exploding, we were at this particular part of town all the time on our lunch break at work. And we were at this particular coffee shop called Extracto. And we don't go there anymore on a regular basis because the CD Baby office moved. But at this time, it was the place where we went to lunch all the time. And we spent so much time like discussing ideas, being excited about the future of music and music distribution and what was happening in our own music careers. And that's when I actually met Henry from Hello Morning at that coffee shop. But that just seemed like so much stuff happened that there was excitement and energy. And when I walked into that coffee shop, I just felt all those feelings of excitement and energy come back, not just in nostalgia, but like the idea of like feeling like I stepped back into that story and remembering all the, the feelings I felt about, you know, just how exciting it was. And I was like, yes, I got to tap into that again, <laughs> because uh, it, it was just one of those reminders of like, sometimes you just need to go back to one of those places where you were in that really creative, excited flow and just step into that story again and for me that's what i did and i was like i was calling and texting several of you i know that this, this podcast who probably thought i was a crazy person <laughs> because i was just so energized <laughs> from the experience well it's like it was either the place uh, uh extracto la bonita all those places we'd go Our early body. on in in the early days of cd baby or we were just in our 20s. <laughs> it could be that too. I, I was not in my 20s. Chris. You weren't in your 20s? Oh, okay. I, I was in my 20s. So I'm, I'm always like, was Portland, Oregon the magical place or was I just 20 or whatever, 25? But I think there was, because the other thing I was texting uh, somebody is you may, I don't think you were with me that day, but one day at Extracto, um, what's the, the woman's name from? Portlandia, I'm terrible with names. Oh, Carrie Brownstein? Yes, yes, Carrie Brownstein. Uh, this was probably when they were working on Portlandia, but it hadn't been released yet. One day we were at Extracto, and I know uh, Sleater Kinney had had their, you know, big album. It was seemed like it was like a year or two prior. Um, and someone's like, that was Carrie Brownstein sitting right next to him. I'm like, oh, really? It, it just felt like that chill Portland Yeah, you see people that, all the like, time that were notable and say. it was when a lot was exploding in portland as well it was a hot spot so it was just kind of like the, re the reminder of that where it, everything felt exciting and i think it's important to revisit some of those places i know as small town poets when we went back to memphis to record at ardent studios again in 2016 which is you know where we did our first big albums back in the 90s stepping into that space it has brought a lot of energy and excitement for wh what we were doing you didn't mention the thing I, I thought you were going to say, which is a deadline. You have a deadline coming up for a new sort of creative project, recording project that involves some collaboration, you know, maybe, maybe so it feels like some new, new music think... partnerships, but also just the fact that you've got to get it done because yeah. there's studio time that's booked and like, Oh yeah. God, are we ready? <laughs> which I, I think is for me, uh, you know, I don't know if that's inspiration or desperation, but sometimes the two are the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's definitely tapping into something you and I are working on for next week. Yeah. 
uh, where we have some studio time booked. Actually, that's an exciting thing. You and I are going to get to record together. Yeah, never which we that. never have, I don't think, right? No, we haven't, not, not other than this. Yeah. All right, well, that was just something that I wanted to share, just like if you're feeling the lack of inspiration, just like listing out some things, remembering those places where you were in that creative flow and maybe going, if it's a physical place, actually going there and like taking stock and, and feeling that creative energy again. Um, Cause I was jacked and I actually posted a video that I recorded right after it um, on my own personal Instagram and TikTok. All right. Well, Chris, AI in music, lots of people are excited. There's a lot of people that are terrified um, it just popped up so intensely right as we closed out 2022 that I'm like, okay, I'm going to dive into this one. This felt like another web three moment where everyone's talking about it all of a sudden. And is it going to catch on like wildfire and be the thing? Is it going to peter out? Is it going to be just this thing that slowly integrates into, uh, the workflow of creative people and, and just industry in general? Um, but first, we got to understand what it is. What is AI? What are we even talking about? Yeah, you know, it's it's good that we're going to start with the very basics because when we did our 2023 predictions episode, I summarized it in a text, you know, blog post that we sent out, and someone actually commented, "Wow, this all sounds really smart, but you use so many acronyms. I don't even know what you're talking about. What's an NFT? What's AI?" And I was like, "Oh, what is AI? All right, we really got to start from bare bones." So I thought we should do it this way. We should ask AI what AI is, which, <laughs> which I did. So, so you in did? The, Perfect. In, when the open AI chat uh, GPT tool uh, in some of their marketing material, they shared that they had t typed in, Hey, what is AI? And they let their own AI program answer. So here it is. Artificial intelligence is an area of computer science that emphasizes the creation of intelligent machines that work and react like humans. Some of the activities computers with artificial intelligence are designed for include speech recognition, learning, planning, problem solving, uh, and then it has a little bit about the history. I guess the term was first used in 1956 by someone at Dartmouth. Yeah, so there you have it. That's AI, which I think is important to define because honestly, uh, I asked uh, the AI machine, <laughs> chat GT, GPT, <laughs> Um, could they come up with a more confusing name I know. for us to say over and over again? There's lots of AI generators out there, but uh, this is a popular one that you've probably heard about. But anyway, I, <clears throat> I asked it some questions related to AI as well that we'll get to uh, further on. But, but what one thing that it, it gave back that I was like, AI, you're actually wrong. What you're talking about is more like the metaverse. Because I think that's one thing with AI and some of these terms that have been thrown around, it's easy to think, oh, we're just talking computers. Um, we're just talking virtual reality. And AI is not uh, virtual reality, although it could absolutely be used. And the metaverse, I'm sure, is intended to be really altered by AI. But we're not talking about goggles where you're walking around in an imaginary world. <laughs> that's right. where, and and uh, I think some people may think that's what's sort of being talked about. <clears throat> Well, I was going to just caveat that I'm a dumb dumb when it comes to all this stuff. And like, sometimes I'll see like the Lex Friedman podcast where like, you know, people who work in AI will talk for three hours at a time. So you could, there's plenty of theoretical and technical information out there and I don't grasp it all. But I, I think one of the basic things we should, we should address is that AI is based on this thing uh, or, or incorporates this thing called machine learning, which is just the idea that you know, you make a computer program, it's supposed to do something, but through this process of machine learning, it gets better at that thing, or it gets quicker or cheaper or whatever, you know, it, it sort of optimizes the results by continually learning. And, and I think some of the examples uh, artists would be familiar with is like it's Spotify's recommendation engine or TikTok's algorithms or um, the way that Facebook or Meta um, optimizes your ad targeting. The more information it gets, the better it gets at doing that thing because it learns what's working, what's not working and with whom. So those are sort of some very basic um, uh, things about machine learning that I think we already are familiar with. Yeah. And I think a key component of AI is it relates to everything. Uh, like what you just said, it's not just taking all that information and analyzing it. It's, it's making, taking that information and 
making decisions to get future outcomes. Um, so it's changing as it's going. So it's not just data analysis. It's the idea that it's trying to think like a human and make uh, assumptions and decisions like a human would without having the human there. And I think that's the part that freaks most people out because uh, the data analysis and they're like, hey, out of all the things you tried, this one worked the best. You might want to put more money on that one. Uh, when you're talking about ads, like you just mentioned, that's one thing. But the idea that, hey, we don't need you. we don't need your brain anymore because <laughs> we we can we made our own brain. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think that is um, a good way of explaining something that you had said when we talked about this when we were planning this episode, which is AI is or even sort of a specific example of AI like chat GPT. It's not simply search. It's not behaving like a Google search where you say like what's the best taco in Kansas city or whatever it, what it's doing is synthesizing a bunch of information from a bunch of sources and then creating something, you know, quote unquote new uh, with that synthesis for a specific purpose with a specific perspective. Um, you know, so yeah. not just what's the best taco, but like, I don't know what's a better example, like um, write me an essay about why people in Kansas City love tacos. I mean, that's a terrible example, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, a good example is uh, I just did it this morning, and we will get into uh, all the pros and cons in just a second. But I used it to generate an artist bio. I said, write me. I said, act like an independent musician who has a new album to promote. Write me an artist bio using a, a very creative artist bio using these bullet points as information and it wrote me a i told it 300 word and it wrote me a 300 word bio uh very creatively <laughs> and yeah. and so that that's an example of like it took some things and then made a whole new thing out of it and it looks like a human wrote it so go ahead oh, i was just gonna say one one thing before i know we'll touch on these things and more specifically later but so far in my using these tools I've found it useful for three sort of general um, benefits. One is to just um, kind of do some of that, um, I don't know, just the day-to-day kind of grind work of having a music career, like write me a bio, that sort of stuff. The next thing is kind of stirring up inspiration in ways where my brain might be shut off in certain ways, but the AI kind of um, complements it. And so you, you kind of send your own creativity in a new direction. Uh, and then the last thing is, even when it's creating sort of rote information, you know, um, 10 things to know about how to do this, right? You ask it and it prints up a plan. Maybe you already know eight of them. That's great. But, oh my God, I didn't think about those two. And so in a way where it's like, yeah, uh, plugging up the holes of things that have um, gone unaddressed or unremembered in your own efforts, I found it really useful for that. Yeah, I agree with all those things. And I've got some... A uh, specific example of that last one that you said, but let me let me hit my list that <clears throat> I have here. Uh, where'd my notes go? Oh, okay. So here's the benefits. Well, I'm going to list them, then we can talk about them. You hit on a couple already. So some of the key benefits that people are talking about as it comes to music creation and, and any sort of creative art form, but we're talking about music. So ideation, just like what you just said, Chris, that being one of them, we'll come back to that. Uh, pushes you out of a creative box. That's another one. You touched on that. Virtual assistant type work. Um, you also mentioned that one too. Um, one that uh, I think is going to be popular is a content generator for all the stuff we have to make around the music. So it's like, hey, this can, I, complaining about having to do all this other stuff that's not just the music. Well, let AI create all that junk that you throw on social and stay working on music. Um, another thing is it speeds workflow in numerous areas related to our music career. And then you know, we, we tend to talk about the perspective from the artist, but I think, uh, and you, we talked about in my prediction, the predictions episode that I, that, that some of the platforms, music platforms have stagnated streaming platforms. I think AI could really, really kickstart music discovery again in an interesting way. Um, because I feel like algorithms tend to bring people into a narrower and narrower lane where you can't get out of it. And then you feel like there's millions of tracks. And now I only experience ones that all sound the same mm -hmm. um, where AI, I think could be put to work to really explode music discovery and um, help people find 
uh, more music that they wouldn't otherwise, especially in a world where there's so much music being created. So that that's some of the benefits that I listed as the perspective of a creator, as an artist. We'll get to the concerns in a minute. But uh, the, Chris, you already touched on that idea of it creating a list and one being I not, you know, oh, I didn't think of that. I specifically uh, created a video, um, Music Marketing Mistakes. I, I asked ChatGPT, which we should say right if we haven't really made clear. There's lots of platforms out there. One that is being used a lot is called ChatGPT. Um, and so you've probably heard that thrown around there. It's just like an app that you go in and it's just almost like a portal to the AI machine. <laughs> you ask it questions you tell it to do stuff and it returns data and information back to you uh, and just one thing it's made by open ai which is recently i think what acquired by microsoft or they made some investment in it and it's the same group of people who made the dolly um ai visual uh, generator editor uh, which people probably started seeing a whole bunch of when image, did people start yeah. using that like Sometime last year, I think. It was like in the summer, it really started popping up all these uh, AI image generators. Mm -hmm. But, um, and one thing you should also know, if you go to chat GPT, or if you search that, you're going to end up at OpenAI. I think it's openai.com or something like that. Um, it is super buggy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it'll Which say so many times, like the servers are overloaded, can't do it. You just got to keep refreshing and use a different browser and... It's kind of a pain. There's a, a desktop app you can download, which I've done. And I thought, oh, maybe they give that priority. It, they're both equally as buggy. So that's sort of the tool that a lot of people use. There's lots of different tools out there when it comes to AI, especially with music creation. There's a lot of companies that have just AI music creating apps. Um, but when going back to the like the the list, I asked it, tell me the, the key marketing mistakes artists make. And I'm like, it's not going to know any, it's not going to surprise me with anything. They're all going to be generic. And there was a lot of good ones that it made a decent list, but the one that was like, Oh, I would not have thought of that. That's a good observation. It was saying that one of the big marketing mistakes artists make is not keeping up with the, the current trends and market conditions. And I was like, that's, I would not have expected it to know that. And mm -hmm. the idea that, you know, and I mentioned in the video how many people, artists come up to me, and you've experienced this as well, where they're like, I made an album and therefore people should listen to it. I shouldn't have to do anything to market this music. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what world you're living in. Um, you know, that was never true, right? That was never true, even though they'll insist it was true at one point. Uh, I don't know what world they're living in. Maybe that's some new meta world that's been created where oh. artists... They, well, everything's they write easy. A song in there that that's that should be an app that somebody creates. You write a song, and then in that world, you're instantly famous. You're on you. a stage with the goggles on, and millions of people are clapping. <laughs> that's good. That that's good. Um, yeah. So it, it it was just interesting to use it. Like there wasn't many surprises, but like oh, that one item that it thought of surprised me. So that's where I thought like, you know, it could be useful in pushing people out of their creative box. As artists, we tend to, you know, write and record in a very, I don't know, linear way where we we grow and change over time, but it's not like we make any huge leaps in any direction creative creatively, most most likely. And this could be used to really push you out and and make you experience and explore different things as an artist. Yeah, I have a few things to say. So stop me if it gets a little rambly, but one thing I want to address is for the basics, like where is it finding this information? How did it know that? How did it know the 10 things it told you? Well, it is sourcing, uh, you know, basically the entire internet uh, for all of human wisdom to, you know, as I said, synthesize something and spit out a new version of that wisdom. Um, but it, it got me thinking about in the Pink Floyd Live at Pompeii documentary, there's a scene where they're in the studio recording Dark Side of the Moon. And they're like playing with synthesizers that have these arpeggiators that are running. Mm -hmm. And I think David Gilmore, I forget who it is, is saying like, you know, we get asked a lot if we're just pushing a button on a machine and the machine's doing all the work. And for them, it was very much no, like we're using the tools available and we're still making decisions about, you know, how to use those tools, what inputs we put in. And then almost more importantly is no matter what the, the, the machines create, the synthesizers, the arpeggiators, 
they're still serving as sort of the ultimate curator to say, yeah, of these 400 different patterns, we like these two the best. So we made our songs around those and made the choice to make that what represents this song on this album. So I do feel like in some way there's a, an equivalent to all this new AI stuff is that it's not spitting out finished st human stuff. It's spitting out options basically. <clears throat> and the ways in which you take use discard any elements of this, I feel like is kind of our own synthesis of what it is doing with synthesis. If that makes any sense. Um, I, I think I, I probably have some examples I can show later, but it's basically no, uh, helping yeah. us curate. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally follow you with that example. And when you were saying that, I'm wondering, yeah, humans still need to determine what humans will like. And I'm like, well, actually, if AI, <laughs> if, AI, if AI works like it should, that, that it should know what humans like. And I think that's what, what's in the cons. We'll, we'll dive into some stuff, but we're sticking with the pros. I agree. Like what you're saying, when I think about it, it's like, it, at some point, it still has to be curated to a degree, and someone has to curate that creativity into something that people want to listen to. Um, and AI can be like I love I love your example because basically you could take a band from today using AI music creation tools and have that same conversation, like overlay that Pink Floyd conversation, and it's the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, because the machine is making that a part arpeggiation. And I remember when, you know, you watch some of those documentaries and when synthesizers and sample, especially when samplers first came out, like in the eighties and people were like, that's, that's not real music because it's a sample. And it's like, fast forward to today. That just sounds like lunacy that people would think that a sample ruins um, the, the creation process, the, the original. Well, so your first idea of the benefits was ideation. And it got me thinking about how AI is bringing up again, the question of what is art, because, you know, through the 20th century, at least maybe earlier, there've been forms of, of music, but I'm thinking particularly of poetry where you basically just have this experimental form where you open an existing book that's been written by some other author and you come up with a process to say like, I'm going to pick the third word from every other page, smash them together. And that's my experimental poem, which is kind of a systematized curation process. And so if you use AI or chat GBT particularly, which people have been sharing like finished poems that it writes or finished lyrics, you can say, write me a song about what it's like to climb a mountain and like three seconds later it's fully formed song which is crazy but you could say i'm stuck on this line that i've written of my own song what rhymes with that last line and you know normal songwriters probably are used to going to rhymezone.com and seeing the options and then you like still have source.com yeah yeah <laughs> and you still have to make the next line but you could say i'm stuck i don't know what's next chat gpt write me a line that rhymes with this but to get back to my systematized curation thing, um, it doesn't mean you're going to love that line and it doesn't mean you need to keep it, but you could keep pressing reset, reset, try again, try again until finally one appears where like, oh my God, I never would have thought of that. It's perfect. And now you have a sort of accidental co-writer that in a way is still your own work because it was your own <laughs> sensibilities that decided what felt right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and beyond just like specific lines which you absolutely can do and uh i i think is going to be a hot button issue in 2023 and beyond <laughs> uh when we'll get to that in the cons in just a bit but uh not only that like uh we are going to be in kansas city next week we've got studio time there's some original tracks that we're working on with some folks and uh one of them was one of the songs was being finished up, had a verse that still need to be written. And I didn't go to chat GPT to get lines, but I wanted, you know, the took the title of the song and said, tell me in a metaphorical sense, describe what this is. Oh. Uh, and to try and get more ideas to maybe perspective or different viewpoints to write that second verse about. And it was interesting what it came up with. Um, sometimes you can come up with, it comes up with very basic stuff. Sometimes it's like pretty good insight. So uh, that's that's one of those things where the ideation process and pushing you out of your creative box, I think it can be helpful. 
The other thing, which is totally the opposite end of the spectrum, is it's great at doing a lot of uh, just virtual assistant, dumb clerical work that we have to do as artists. And I think this might be where a lot of the helpfulness of it comes in, where it can do some extra lift for you in areas that you're just wasting time. Um, and whether that's research or uh, all sorts of things. For example, this is something I did right before we uh, we got on uh, to record this. Let me find. I asked it, act as you are a talent booker having to book a rock band on tour in Portland, Oregon. Gather a list of all the venues that book rock bands in that area. And I, I was doing this as a test because I know the venues in this area. So I, I would be able to, right. I would know how, if it's like, come on, that's, that's like saying the arena that the, 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 the big band artists play at, you know, but the list was actually incredibly helpful and it had some venues that were, uh, you know, like Chris will know what this means, like the crystal ballroom and the Aladdin theater stuff. That's probably not where you're going to go as an independent artist first, mm -hmm. um, but it had a lot of smaller venues that I wouldn't have expected to be on the list. And so if you're trying to book a tour through cities you've never been to, you could waste a lot of time online trying to figure out the right cities and, or the right venues and things. Or you can use a tool like this that probably can pull that list for you really fast and give you at least a great starting point. I was thinking about tour stuff this morning with it and, and wondering, I didn't ask it this, but I, I was thinking, what if I gave it? 14 cities that I'm going to tour through over a two or three week period. Like, could it plot me the most sort of gas cost efficient routing and then give me the venues like you're saying in each of those cities. So it's like, not only do I know the order I should try to target the dates, but who to reach out to. Um, yeah. One of the things, one of the sort of busy work things I had it do, I'll bring up my uh, examples here is I had it write me a blog pitch to, to a blogger. Uh, for my music. And, and I think we should caveat this by saying like it was able to do an okay job because I have sufficient stuff written about me online. Like if you're just starting out, it might be only picking stuff from your website or your own official bios. But so for this blog pitch, it said, um, I said, write, write a pitch to a hip indie music blogger about why they should do a feature story on blah, 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 on my newest album. And it, it you know, it did a decent job of Chris Robbie's latest album is a must listen for fans of indie music with its thought provoking lyrics and unique blend of folk and alternative rock. The album offers a fresh and captivating perspective. Blah, blah. It goes on. It's generic, but if I was just stumped and like intimidated by even beginning to write a pitch, I'm like, I could probably hack that in half and change a few words and, and it would serve as a pitch. Yeah. And that's what I, the other thing I liked about it. And I did with an artist bio, putting in some bullet points and then trying to, um, to under, you know, have it generate like a framework and some language to already work with. So I'm not spending as much time writing some of this stuff from scratch. We end up having to do all sorts of over and over again um, as, as artists, like descriptions. Oh, I need a 200 word description. It's like you get like a nice bio that's like 300 words and then you go to a website and it's like a hundred word limit. Like, oh crap. It's like, I think then we waste time trying to rework everything. I think this tool is something that's awesome for having various variations of things that you know you need over and over again, like various bio lengths and things like that, and that you can easily tweak to fill in the rest of it. But I know that whenever we've got new music coming out, that just drives me crazy how much time all that takes. And this is like a nice way to jump, you know, speed that up. Yeah. Um, speaking of bios, I just wanted to share this. I had a few to go through real quick, but this one, I said, write a one paragraph biography of musician Chris Robley that can be used on the homepage of his website. And it spit out an okay thing, but it claimed that I played in a band that I've never even heard of. Um, it had some other things that were like of dubious <laughs> factual. So, and, and actually the chat GPT um, warning will say like, it's been known to return false information and stuff. So, you know, it's far from perfect, but one of those little task upkeep tasks that I cannot stand is that because I ignore my social for so long, whenever I go and I've like, let's say I've shared a video 
that's doing well and that'll have a bunch of comments and now I feel obligated to respond to, but I don't want to be like, hey, thanks. Hey, thanks. Hey, thanks. Hey, thanks. <laughs> like same thing. You know, you feel like a dumb, generic, whatever yeah. machine yourself. So I said, hey, this is the perfect task for AI. So I, I, I said, compose 50 unique one sentence responses to a person on Instagram who says, I love your song. And it spit out 50 responses. And again, like some of them are pretty cheesy and generic, um, but some of them I wouldn't have thought of. And uh, now I can sort of cut and paste from there <laughs> without having to feel like a robot myself. Yeah, I think that's a perfect example of some of those things where anything that starts to feel repetitive, using this tool to get you out of that repetition because yeah. it's going to throw some different ideas at you. Uh, the last thing on the the uh, benefit side that I wanted to touch on a little bit more was the content generator for all the stuff we have to make around our music. So, you know, a big complaint for artists is like, I just wanted to play music. I just want to write and record music. And now I have to make videos. I have to do all this other content. And um, that's where these tools can be incredibly useful because it can take your assets and the elements that you have and populate or make content that will probably perform pretty well on social. Um, there's already lots of videos online about how to do this and tips for, for using AI and tools like chat GPT to really uh, improve your, your content output and response based on using the AI tool. So that's an area where I think Hey, that's helpful. You know, if I've got to make all this junk, let this machine do it. If it's yeah. going to be right most of the time anyway, I stop wasting my time doing it. I, yeah, I recommend people go on the Dolly uh, homepage and just play around with some of the options they let you do before you even have an account. Like you can say pretty much anything. Uh, I think one of the examples is like um, make a, an illustration of two bears shopping in the style of like ancient Japanese art. And it instantly does it. And then you just change one parameter. Make me a, a Van Gogh painting of two uh, bears shopping in space. And it instantly changes it. So I was like, this this has to be like the marketing version. And it's way harder. <laughs> um, so I went in, I created an account. And I took a picture, like an old picture of me. And I said, like, extend this picture without having any of the information of what might have existed in reality beyond the borders of the, of the frame, extend this with an astronaut with a hot dog on one side, a dinosaur on the <laughs> other, uh, the moon in the sky, smoking a cigar and a bunch of other stuff. And here's what it came up with like pretty quickly. So uh, you told it with the moon smoking a cigar. Yeah. I, 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 okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it did the work of extending sort of the natural landscape, uh, the field, the trees. And, and obviously it has no idea what the, what the real field looked like. I just noticed the trees are just floating in the air. In They're the air. Even, yeah. It's so <laughs> random, but cool. Like, I mean, this looks terrible and trashy, but if you took your time with it and you really had a particular, I was trying to go with the most ridiculous surreal thing, but if you had a, um, <laughs> A specific, uh, you know, aesthetic to go for. You could keep refining until it gave you. By the way, I, I wanted it to say happy hour. And for some <laughs> reason, it spit out happy hoppy. Uh, it knew better than you, Chris. It knew it that, I would get a, it, that would get a laugh where <laughs> where happy hour, people are like, whatever. whatever. Um, for the record, the, the website Chris is talking about is D-A-L-L hyphen E. Um, he's not going to dolly.com where he's picking up some dolls and... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, uh, yeah, is that like a Dolly, Dolly Parton, uh, website? Yeah, it's doll hyphen e. Well, if you put that in, you'll get to their website. And yeah, and, so, and actually, the chat GPT tool and Dolly you can use from the same account login, they're both made by the same group. Yeah, yeah. Um, so before we move on, the last thing I'll say is I asked, um, AI, chat GPT, list all the reasons why artists and musicians should, oh wait, no, wait, I said should be, oh dang it, I did it in a different window. We'll skip it. Um, I asked it why they should uh, use AI or be excited about AI. And I think that did it in my browser um, or a different window. But I then asked it, after I created my list for concerns, I put all my concerns down and the things that I found online and just um, stuff that 
you know, I've been hearing people talk about. Uh, then I had it generate a list of why it should be concerned. And so we'll do our list first, and then we'll see what AI has mm. to say about it. So, right. <laughs> so here are the concerns that uh, people have uh, about AI. And there are some very doom and gloom uh, concerns out there for as it relates to AI and what it could do to the world. First, there's lots of copyright issues and questions as it relates to music. Currently, uh, the copyright law says anything created by a machine is not, you can't copyright it. It has to be created by a human. However, we've already discussed some things in this episode that provide some gray area to that where, well, what does that mean if I help, it helps me write a verse or a line of a lyric and I use that line? I'm still the one that's going to claim the song as a songwriter and publish it. Uh, so where does that line come in as people create software tools and own the software that's generating these things? There's a lot of gray area around that. And I know that that alone is going to be a big hot topic this year. Um, and relating to what Chris was just talking about with the artwork, uh, a big concern is taking people's intellectual property and creating derivative works illegally. So uh, sourcing a bunch of stuff and content online to create something new uh, and, um, and you know, in the attributes of an artist in, or even using the pieces of their work. I know that um, for uh, a lot of people in the art world, in the illustration world, there's a lot of anxiousness and anger and frustration towards it because it's like, I could, you, in the example you just said, Chris, the going to that Dolly site and saying, hey, make my artwork in the, like, in the style of Van Gogh and basically ripping off Van Gogh's style and being really, really looking like it actually was a Van Gogh. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> there's concern. So there's a lot of concern that you're like, you were taking my creative output and just ripping it off. Where's the line? So that's one thing. Uh, then the next one is filling the world with infinite mindless art. I saw that one company was bragging online that they had already generated 10 million AI tracks. Uh, this is just since the fall. And uh, so it was basically generating 14,000 new songs a day. And uh, there's already a lot of artists generating a ton of songs. And now we've got machines just throwing more crap into the mix. So what, what happens in a world where there's just mindless, endless art. Then next concern, replacing humans. That's a concern. Uh, a, another concern is it can still identity or persona. And that kind of goes into um, what I mentioned about the art, like ripping and mimicking things that are already in existence. But beyond that, uh, doing deep fakes and doing things that make it sound like, uh, you know, it's easy to make it look like you've got video of me saying something that's maybe objectionable, inappropriate or whatever. You know, it's like real easy to to, to mess with people's identities and personas. Uh, cultural appropriation and genre, we'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, it could be an issue. Um, could stifle human creativity in general if we all just become computer, <laughs> people operating computers and the computers are doing all the creativity. And then the last one I had on here was um, what happens when knowledge is used that isn't earned. And uh, I just watched all the Jurassic Park movies <laughs> this fall. And that was kind of a reminder of like, they're using all this knowledge that they didn't, uh, they didn't have to work for. So they don't understand the implications of just throwing it around willy nilly. And that was the end of Jurassic Park. They didn't know how to manage. They didn't respect the knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Or they didn't respect the idea that some knowledge shouldn't be regained or attained in the first place. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's like when, and, what's uh, that theory of uh, there's the the marbles you can pull out of the existential hat, but eventually you'll pull one out that you can't ever put back and it'll end the entire world. I've not heard this one. I don't like marbles, so I'm just going to oh. stay away from them. <laughs> oh, yeah, stay away. It's, you know, it's a existential dread metaphor uh, for for progress. Well, people that are very concerned about AI might say that the movie The Matrix was actually actually a documentary that someone <laughs> sent from the future because this is the, the the doomsday scenario in the movie The Matrix, which is still one of my all time favorites. The music in that's fantastic. The story's fantastic. The the cinematography is great. But um, is that the humans uh, 
become taken over by the computers and they don't even know it. They're just batteries to power the machine world. And, uh, you know, spoiler alert, Neo and crew figure that out and bring them down. <laughs> so if you haven't seen The Matrix by now, you can't get mad at me for spoiling it, spoiling but it's amazing. It. Well, you know, I, I feel like every uh, year or two, the, the documentary, It Might Get Loud or whatever that is called, comes up. And I used to, whenever it did, I used to talk a lot of crap about Jack White as much as I love his music. In that mo movie, he used to strike me as such a, I don't know, like <laughs> stubborn nostalgist for no good reason. Like he, he basically said, I like to have an out of tune guitar because it gives you something to fight against. And when you fight against it, it brings out the humanity and what's good and the struggle. And the struggle is what gives us purpose. And I was like, you're an idiot. It but sounds very pretentious. <laughs> right. It, but in relation to, I don't know, now that I think back, I haven't watched it in a while, but now I'm like, maybe he had a point. Like, if we live in a world where everything becomes, I don't know if easy is even the right word, but like noisy, overpopulated with just things that were made without human effort or, or much human effort, uh, I worry about us all turning into those um, people from Wally who just, I was just about to say that <laughs> float around and like sip out of straws and just have information inputs, but don't really do anything. I'm like maybe human purpose and existence is about some amount of struggle. You know, it's like, I don't want to like sound like a total Luddite or, or idiot and say, we all need to like go back to agrarian lifestyle and be paleo or whatever to have purpose, but like maybe some amount of difficulty in create, at least in creativity, if not in how we spend our work hours is worthwhile. Yeah. I, it's one of those things where speaking of Wally, where it feels like, and this relates to creativity as well, just like what you're saying and that when everybody gets anything that they want instantly that pops in their mind with no work, they become unhappy really, really fast. And, and people think, no, I'd be so happy if I got all those things. No, it's part of the joy of, especially the creative process is that struggle. It's like that song that you write that you had to struggle through and then suddenly it clicks and all comes together and feels like this amazing thing. That's the creative process where you're like on fire. I, you know, that song I've talked about off of our record, Say Hello. We didn't even, you know, we went to Memphis. We didn't even record it at Memphis because we're like, this song's probably not going to make the record. Nobody likes it. Um, we went and totally deconstructed it and created this new thing that became one of our favorite songs we've ever written. And it was that struggle through the creative process that made us appreciate the outcome even more. And that doesn't happen when you just push in some parameters and spit out a song. Well, it's reminding me of how <clears throat> you and I probably rolled our eyes as kids when like, our parents would drop us off at the mall and we'd complain that we had to wait outside for five minutes for them to come pick us up. And they'd be like, I have to used to walk to the playground three miles uphill in the snow, both ways, you know, and we'd roll our eyes, but like their needing to do that may have made arriving at the playground all the more joyous and, and yeah. hard earned. And so now I have that sense of like, if my daughter's watching something on streaming TV and she scrolls through everything on Netflix and scrolls through everything on Disney and everything on HBO and everything on Amazon and everything on Apple TV or whatever. <laughs> and is like, ah, I'm bored. I don't want to watch anything. Or like she'll start something and turn it off like five minutes later and start something. I'm like, you know, when I was a kid, there was one station with kids programmings, like, <laughs> and whatever it was, I waited through the commercials and I was psyched even when it, when it was terrible. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we had, had the to love watch. He Man and and um, uh, Gem and the holograms and whatever because it was all there was. But there was like I, now I'm like, oh, maybe maybe the uphill both ways in the snow actually has some wisdom in it. Well, here's the thing. Uh, I could riff on that for a long time. I had to watch reruns of I Love Lucy on end for hours because there was like three channels and that's uh -huh. all my parents would watch. Um, Flipper and Mash and uh, uh, yeah, that's all that Gilligan's was Gilligan's Island. Yeah, that's why I'd go outside because that I'm not I'm done with that crap. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the the one thing though I I was thinking when you were talking was that anybody now could go use an AI thing and create an album and release an album and call themselves an artist, and it could even perform well. But what they won't know is what it feels like to be an artist because. There's a feeling you have as an artist when you create something 
that is so personal, that comes out of you, that surprises you, that pulls you in different directions. And at the end, you it sits there and you look at it and you go, I did that. That came out of me. That's a feeling you can't create by pushing some entries into, you know, computer and having it spit out an album for you. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and so the... there'll be all these frustrated artists in the, in the future that don't know what it feels like to actually have the satisfaction of creating something themselves. <laughs> They're unhappy because they missed out on all the depression and yeah, the depression. Of yeah, that's being right. an actual artist in quotes. Maybe uh, drug use will be down in music. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just had a couple quick thoughts on the copyright issues. Um, and using things um yeah illegally or or not knowing how to provide attribution i was thinking of that even when i was making my image on dolly is like well i'm uploading this original photo but it's adding all this other stuff so if i want to share this as a joke on instagram um you know i'm gonna go and do it anyways because who cares but like legally speaking am i allowed to do that maybe maybe not i don't know what their terms are but you could think um what if you started from scratch using just the AI? You don't even begin with an upload of your own stuff and you say, Hey, make me a concert poster. Um, and it does like now are you, or, or maybe a concert post posters say an album art, uh, album cover, like, can you use it? Probably sometimes. Yes. Sometimes not, but that's all going to be dependent on what the programmers I think set as their terms. And well, yeah. And it's also interesting because it's like you have the software provider, that is harnessing the AI technology. But all these little pieces it's getting to make that image, what are they? Where did they come from? Who ultimately has the rights to them? Um, yeah, it's, it's, there's so many questions that I think are going to be hot topics this year in the music business as, as this starts to explode and become more and more common here's um to, to throw crypto in for a moment here's what's going to happen in a few years ai will become self-aware it's going to form a dao to return to another acronym from a few years ago and it's going to be uh, paid in crypto and it's going to accumulate all of the world's wealth manage it in this dao treasury and humans will have nothing that could be but if that was the case, wouldn't humans just say that crypto is meaningless? Nobody cares. It's just numbers in a computer. It doesn't <laughs> represent anything. <laughs> I mean, that's a good way to trick the AI into, you know, distracting itself, thinking it's running its own empire <laughs> and it's king of the universe. And, and you're, you're, you just uh, got to feed the AI beast every once in a while. So it thinks it's alive and well. <laughs> Lords over a meaningless economy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the one thing that I, that, uh, concern that I wanted to highlight from my list that I thought was interesting that people brought up was the cultural appropriation or genre appropriation. And I think the cultural appropriation uh, can come up a lot uh, with these type of things. But when with genre, it, it was sort of an interesting thought. And, um, and by the idea of just taking different genres and creating new genres, but also the ability to, again, it's kind of like the idea of saying like the knowledge used, but not earned. It's like not me, not being a hip hop artist, being able to release a bunch of hip hop tracks that perform well. And uh, just because I used some AI interface and it knew how to game the system for lack of a better term, or uh, creating new genres that didn't exist before, but didn't emerge out of human cultural evolution but just because a machine could put mash things up together hmm. that was one thing that people brought up as, as a concern and and that i could see i think the um the cultural appropriation in music i could see being an issue like a certain genre pops up like k-pop is popular right now i could use ai and generate a whole bunch of k-pop music uh being a, a an american living in the portland area that's never been to korea uh i could uh, create something that the market likes without having any knowledge or interaction with that, that community. And I think that's a concern that people have, which is, which is legitimate, not beyond just not with just music, but beyond music as well. Well, the other, 
you mentioned it filling the world with infinite mindless art, which touches upon another sort of, uh, I think that's a component of this other concern I have, which is just about the acceleration of everything. Like uh, not just creation, but uh, synthesizing information. How, I don't know, just everything's getting faster and faster and faster. Uh, demanding more of our attention or more um, moments of our attention. It doesn't demand much longer attention, but I just, this is very Luddite of me to say, I guess, but like, just, I worry that we're, we don't know how to be bored anymore. We don't know how to be quiet. No, I can't, that's a real problem. I, I can't I mean, pass two minutes at a rest. If I'm at a restaurant with a friend and they get up to go to the bathroom, I'm like, don't take your phone out. Don't take your phone out. Like I make a test of it. And sometimes I succeed, but half the time within a minute, the phone's out and I'm like scrolling through something like, why am I like this? And to bring it back to just this most like headline grabby truth, I guess, is like, it's not making any of us happier. I don't think humans are happier for all of this speed and ease. No, it just makes a small group of people a lot more money and more right. rich and more rich and the rest of us more miserable. Yeah. No, I I, th I mean, that gets talked out a, a lot about, especially if, I mean, both of us have children of school age where there's a lot of discussion about uh, that generation uh, never experiencing boredom and they don't, which actually can inhibit creativity because there's always information coming in. They never have to sit, be quiet and struggle with, you know, coming up with ideas. Like when I went on a, you know, a, my family used to take these massive road trips across the U S every summer. I'd be sitting in the car for hours, just staring out the window. With the nothing. Trees. I know you'd like make inventing in your head. Yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me pretend there's someone <laughs> hopping from tree to tree in my mind. Like exactly. And, and we're now everyone's instantly, they, they're driving 10, 10 minutes down the street. They've got a movie on. I'm like, uh, that, that does change how your brain works. And yeah. so there it's, it's not just, there's lots of people talking about peak attention and stuff like that. So yes, I agree that this could make it even worse and accelerate things where, um, you you become that person in that Wally chair, uh, just you know having no purpose in existence other than to exist, so some other people can make money off of you. Yeah. And that's the real, <laughs> real weird thing when you think about it. Um, but uh, hey, let me get to my list of that I uh, I asked AI uh, list the reasons why artists and musicians should be concerned about AI. And here's the, here was this, its list. I made my list first. Automation of music production. And that's one uh, that was on my list, but we didn't really dive into yet. Uh, I'll come back to that. Competition for jobs, copyright issues, lack of originality, the challenge of understanding AI's creative process, the potential for AI to create fake music, the potential for AI to be used for music piracy. And it had more little, like a line that went with each of one of those. But but the funny thing was, I loved its little bit of propaganda at the end. <laughs> it's oh, said, it's it? important to note that AI is not replacing the human artist entirely, but rather it's opening new possibilities and ways of creating and promoting music. Artists and musicians need to be aware of the potential impacts and opportunities presented by AI and adapt to them. <laughs> right i didn't ask right. for that i just asked for the concerns and i just thought it was funny that it like gave a rebuttal at the end that's amazing <laughs> it's already prompting us to accept it into our yeah, lives it's like you will accept here's all the reasons <laughs> but forget that you will bow to me uh, um so we didn't talk about uh the one area where i do think is an immediate concern um and uh is with music production or production music if you're not familiar with the term production music that in the sync world is a whole segment of music and it's music that you've heard a bazillion times. It's all the stuff in TV shows and sometimes shopping experiences and places where you might be in public or where there's music, but it's not music you need to be paying attention to. So in shows, it's like the background synth pad that they just want in there at some point. It's not recognizable. It just fills some gap of music. Um, production music can be more advanced. It can be like complete songs and stuff, but it's typically more generic in, in, in nature. It's not intended to be a featured artist. It's intended to serve a background purpose mostly, or, you know, what, what happens a lot on TikTok, um, when you add a beat, uh, 
a lot of times those are artists or you might add some music, a lot of those artists, but some of it is just production music. They just made for that purpose of having something in a 30 second video. Um, that to me is the, if you're somebody that owns a catalog like that or um, makes a lot of money from sync, there's some big catalogs that that's all they do. That could be problematic because like that example I said already, that company said they generated 10 million songs since the fall. Uh, when was, the, a when the AI warned that, or I don't know, warned, listed uh, fake music as one of the concerns, how is it defining fake? Because let me see, is it music wholly composed by AI without any human input? Oh, this is this is it. This was another concern. Um, AI can be trained to mimic the style of a particular artist and create music that is difficult to distinguish from human created music. This could lead to issues with authentic. Authen Authenticity. authenticity AI would not screw up that word three times authenticity and trust in the music industry that that was one thing um, there there's a whole lot of rabbit holes you can go down and there's videos that uh, I've watched about like really advanced usage of these tools most people will start approaching them like a search engine and uh, <clears throat> that's like the top layer it's when you get down and know how to instruct it to do work you can have it build full business plans for you which I've done um, with complete with a name, tagline, marketing plan, and everything, uh, you can do that with just knowing how to prompt it the right way. Um, and so where I've seen this come up in potentially in music is saying, mix my track like it sounds like it was mixed by so-and-so who mixed the Beatles or so-and-so who mixed Coldplay or Beyonce or something like that. And it being able to take your tracks and really mimic somebody's style of work um now you could say there's already some tools that do that in music creation that aren't ai they're just like you know i've got a tool i love called easy drummer three and it'll if i want it'll make a, a drum kit that sounds exactly like led zeppelin from when the levy breaks uh -huh. and so that already exists to some degree but it just feels like this cheapens it and makes it even harder um, and it's interesting to see, it'll be interesting to see how like DSPs react when this becomes a thing, because you and I both know that for a while, we had a lot of artists that used to do tribute albums and some of the platforms stopped accepting those because they felt like they were people that were trying to game the system and trick fans into thinking that it was music by the original artist. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, the business plan thing and, and just to return to maybe some of the benefits real quick. I had it do, um, I think I asked it like, Hey, write a business plan for a live streaming musician who wants to make that their full-time job within a year. Um, and a spit out a plan. I also asked it like, um, how would you, what advice would you give to an artist? Um, I think I gave it a particular genre too that wants to do grow its Spotify following amongst people like 18 to 30 or something. And it spit out a plan for that too. And in both cases, like I was saying earlier, a lot of it I already knew it seemed sort of obvious and wrote, but in both cases, there were things that I were like, Oh, that's a really good reminder, I guess, you know, not totally novel information, but I wouldn't have remembered to prioritize that if I were to have to write a business plan. Yeah. Yeah, and I think those are those are some cool things. Like uh, you can do a lot of searches around, um, like what you said. I like how I think what where this is helpful is when you get very specific because I think uh, typically when we get specific and do Google searches, that's where we have a hard time finding certain info. So like like you said, a business plan for an artist that wants to do live streaming only. If I Googled that, I'm, I might get an article from a blog. Like, mm -hmm. um, and that's actually one thing that you and I, I think it was you and I were talking, we were wondering, well, is it just pulling information from like our blogs that we have out there? And yeah, and, and, I'm and, sure it is. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. But, um, but I think using this, like getting specific and, uh, giving it personas is another thing like that's helpful in these that you get some ideas back at times that you didn't think of, mm -hmm. or you would, you're like, oh yeah, I, I remember that. I, and I think that's very helpful. Um, yeah. And actually in particular in the Spotify example, where I was saying like, what would you tell an artist if they really wanted to appeal to, um, 18 to 30 year olds? And it said, you know, like 
collaboration is really big in that demographic or that age group. So, you know, here's how to find some collaborators and then make sure you have the collaborators do these things to reach their young audience, you know? So yeah, not, not totally novel, but like it wouldn't have been the first thing I thought of if I was like, I got to reach the kids with my music. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's, it, it's interesting when you start diving, I was looking at some of the things I had it do uh, that I felt worked and didn't. Uh, I think one area where we talked about, uh, ex, uh, you know, speeding up workflow or helping your content. Um, one of the things you can do is ask it to act as a fancy title generator. So I, I said, I want you to act as a fancy title generator. I will type keywords via comma and you will reply with fancy titles. My keywords are marketing, comma, music, comma, $50. I shot a video on my Instagram and TikTok where I was like, marketing your music on social for $50. So I wanted a title for it. And it gave me about 10 different titles. Uh, one of them was marketing maestro of music, maximizing ROI with a $50 budget. Nope. Not using that one. <laughs> that is marketing, fancy, but not marketing good. maestro. That's I'm like, no, the musical marketer crafting a campaign with a frugal $50. Uh, marketing melody achieve success on a shoestring $50 budget. I don't know where it got the word melody. That was like uh, just thrown in there randomly. Musical marketing mastery, unleashing the power of $50. Marketing mastery of music, crafting a campaign on a budget of $50. So it just kept kind of going on. Uh, and so there was some words that it pulled in that I wouldn't wasn't necessarily thinking about like uh, frugal $50 or shoestring $50 budget. So mm -hmm. I ended up coming up with something that wasn't a direct copy of any of these, but it kind of helped get the creative juices flowing. Yeah. And then, the, then there's some where I did. I'm like, that wasn't helpful. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, there's a lot that is going to be happening with AI. Lots of discussions that, it, you know, we could go on and on. And we're going to do another episode later on where we get into some more advanced techniques. I know Chris and I have been experimenting. I've been talking to some other folks that listen to this podcast about ideas some of them that have their own businesses and things and getting their take on it um oh sorry when you're talking about people with their own businesses um and, and in your concerns it was replacing humans but i know one of the biggest concerns is replacing human labor like is this going to put everyone out of work eventually i mean and that is I've, I've said this a lot on the show probably in the past too but like wasn't that the dream of the 1950s like ge like promised us that we we're all going to work for four hours a week and sip margaritas by the pool and it now is within sight but i'm worried that the 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 benefits won't be shared well that's the thing uh it's the i think that's the problem it's the world that gets created is uh, a handful of people that reap all the benefits while the rest of us end up in District nine. <laughs> yes. District nine. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, indeed. Or the everyone randomly a Wally chair just shows up for every person in your household and you get in it. And that's the end. The, the chair just keeps nudging you until you finally sit in it. And then it so zooms you give you up because you have nothing else to do because they <laughs> took everything away. Um, wasn't that why the Roman Empire fell? They just had nothing to do. Nothing to do. <laughs> um <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so I would love to get, uh, if you've been listening to this podcast and you've got thoughts or comments about AI and music and the music business, if you've used it, tried it out, we want to hear from you. Uh, you can call our listener line at 360-524-2209. We can, uh, you can email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. And uh, I'm sure when we this episode is out, we will put together a blog article that has the episode embedded with some links to some resources uh, to some of these platforms that you can test out and try and, uh, you know, experiment with yourself. And it's all still pretty brand new and uh, moving at light speed. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting. And if, if we're still podcasting in five years, like what will AI mean and do then? Because I'm sure the way we're talking about it now someone will listen back and be like, oh, those idiots. Like that was just the, what'd you say? Like the search layer. Yeah. And, yeah. And there'll be a whole bunch of other stuff going on. Well, the, the, some of the people that were 
There's lots of videos on YouTube about this already, about how you can make a million dollars overnight with businesses you don't even run to, to why it's going to be the end of the world. It's pretty fascinating to look at. Um, but some of the things that were like, oh, that is concerning, uh, were the idea that, because you, you brought it up because of the podcast, that you could create digital avatars that look like real people, that sound like real people, where the content is just created by AI and, and just it continues to make videos or ep episodes or you know those content without the people anymore and um wow i wonder if ai chris would be the curmudgeon <laughs> <laughs> well we would be the most screwed because it has 328 episodes to, to watch and and model after yep it, it can... it's, it's the brand new podcasters that are lucky they haven't created enough to be uh, expertly modeled yet it has enough of our voice to make us say anything. Yeah. It even has enough time uh, to age us. So, so, so it could age, keep <laughs> aging us appropriately. Uh, yeah, we're screwed, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll All see right. you uh, with the margarita by the pool. All right. But you know what? It doesn't matter what AI does. Artists will still email us questions, <laughs> and ask us stuff, because I think that that will never end. Um, not that I want it to, but we've got some uh, phone calls and an email so let's get to some real questions by real people here is the first one hey guys uh, my name is paul um i go by the artist name paul anthony land on all platforms um i follow you guys and i've been uh listening to this show for a couple of years now just kind of in the background you know watching and listening and um taking advice you guys give great advice um, my question is, um, when I, when I put my, when I create my music, um, I, after I do everything, uh, upload it to CD Baby and, um, uh, register with, uh, BMI and, you know, do all that. I want to know, are those still necessary things like the register with BMI? I also go through like, uh, sound scan, sound scan. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll register my title, you know, put my UPC code in or whatever that is and, uh, and I wanted to know, is that still necessary to, like, register your title and go to BMI and upload, you know, do a register, um, register title there and register on SoundScan or for SoundScan or whatever, uh, where you um, basically, uh, you know, I just want to know, is that is that something you have to do? Is that necessary to continue to do? Um, so I thank you guys for all that you uh, you do with all the, the podcast the information that you give. It's definitely uh to help uh, us artists. All right, thank you. Thanks for that question. Uh, absolutely, those things are important. Um, if you use our CD Baby Pro option, we will register your songs at all those collection societies. So if you are in the United States, it's important to make sure that your tracks are registered with your PRO. Um, not just you as a writer. That's a big mistake most artists make. They only register themselves as a writer and never tell them what songs they wrote. Uh, they don't know. It's not magic. Uh, Sound Exchange is another one um, that you need to go register with and let them know what works you have out there. Um, he said sound scan, but you don't need to worry about sound scan. I think he, I think he might have meant Sound Exchange, but just to clarify something you said. Uh, CD Baby Pro Publishing will register you and your works with BMI if that's who you work with, but we but not Sound Exchange. We want yeah. you to register directly uh, as an artist with Sound Exchange because it's technically not a publishing royalty. It's related to the sound recording, which is more to do with you as an artist and a label. So go to them directly. Yeah, and it, yeah, it's it's important. I think one of the things that's really challenging for artists and uh, is going to always be, I think, especially as we move into this, continue this digital evolution, like we've been talking on this episode, keeping track of all this stuff is going to be more important than ever in understanding where you need to have all the proper information. And, you know, we're looking at ways to help artists simplify those workflows because um, over time, more platforms will pop up, more usages will pop up. And all those people have to have accurate metadata about your music in order to pay you properly for its usage. So um, using the CD Baby Pro option is a big help in making sure that that's taken care of. Uh, there was something else related to that that I was just thinking of. 
I don't remember. Huh. Uh, uh, it had to do with, oh, I was, I was thinking about it today because Chris, we're going to be in the studio next week with some musicians, uh, some that I've never recorded with or even known before. Um, and working with an engineer I've never worked with before. And I was thinking, I got to remember, I got to get all their information. I got to remember to get attribution down for their contribution, even mm -hmm. if they are just playing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's those things that, um, especially when you're not in a band situation that are easy to forget and, and lose track of over time during the creation of an album. And, and attribution is just something that I think the, the industry is still lacking on mm -hmm. and uh, needs to get better at. All right, let's go to the email that we've got. Greetings, guys. This is Annette uh, at honeywax.com, H-O-N-A-Y wax.com. I did not click that link, so I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> that should be clear. <laughs> Executive producer for an upcoming album by um, uh, Classic Vibes, and that's their IG handle. After five years, we finally have completed 12 amazing songs for our album, Soul Good Love. However, because of costs and just confusion, we're going back and forth about what's best, releasing the entire album at once and then introducing each song one at a time or releasing each song as a single, then create the album. Thank you sincerely, Annette and Classic. I guess Classic is the artist's name. I have a strong suggestion to not lead with the entire album, but to put out some singles, maybe two or three, and then the album, um, which I, I kind of feel like you and I have been on the same page about that for a year or two, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's the winning combination. I think what artists tend to be thinking is, I will release every single track as a single and then release the album. And like, that's not every song on your album is good enough to stand on its own and worthy of all that promotion of its own. Yeah. Um, or maybe worthy is not the right word, but like not every track is appropriate as a single. Like maybe, yeah. maybe you've got a 10 minute epic jam with a huge fade out, like not going to be a great single, but could be the perfect album closer. So Yeah. Exactly. And that's what I meant by uh, not those things. I think there's there's the, that's why I think the album isn't dead is because there's some creative art and especially in music where context and in, you know, in context of a larger movement of work makes an enormous, enormous amount of sense where by itself it it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that. Uh, just because we're in a streaming world and people tend to cherry pick songs means that the art form of music has to die completely and just move to cranking out radio hits. I mean, mm. that's always been the tension forever anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why I like albums. I, they feel bigger. They feel special. And also as an artist, if you release one song, your fans go listen to that song. They might throw it in a playlist. They might listen on repeat a couple times, but they're not going to just put your song on and just have it go over and over and over and over again where they might with an album. And that's what's nice about an album is it's like it's already a pre-constructed playlist that they can put on and keep on repeat mm -hmm. and keep you, you keep them listening to your music as opposed to moving on to something else. Yeah. Um, long time listeners might be sick of this answer, too, but. Another reason you don't want to just leave with the album is it only gives you one chance to pitch your music to Spotify or Amazon or any of the DSPs that lets you pitch to their editorial team. Uh, it's one and done at that point. Whereas if you do a few singles, every one of those songs can be pitched on, on its own. And then the album gives you another opportunity to do the same. And we usually also give this warning that the hope there is obviously that you'll get placed by the editor somewhere, but doesn't happen all that often. What you're really doing is sort of tipping off their search recommendation engine about genre, keywords, any sounds like stuff. You know, it basically just sort of puts you in the running for their algorithm to do its work. Yeah. The taking advantage of the pushing it to the release radar is a big deal. And I believe that there's, I could be wrong, but I believe that their marquee advertising option that you get. I think you only get that with releases as well. Like, I don't think I can go do that with an old release, um, at least not yet. Hmm. So that's something that 
you know, that marquee advertising options where when your fans open up Spotify, it takes over their screen and says new album by so-and-so or new track. Uh, I tried that with our last release. Felt like the results we got were worth the, the marketing spend. And so, yeah, there's other options that become available with each release that you have. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for that email. All right. We've got one more call. Let's get to it. Aloha, guys. This is Tori calling you guys again. Just listen to you. So getting into 2023, your latest podcast, which was awesome. Um, met you guys at the conference. It's pretty awesome. So I have a two-part of question. Uh, the first one is how do you go about finding your audience when there's different variables about you and your style? And also an age factor can come in as well. Um, like I said, you saw, you guys saw how I looked at the conference and then you saw me walking around with a ukulele. And so some people assume that I'm reggae or whatever, but I'm not, you know, um, although I do play those kind of songs sometimes, but my style is a very different style. And then going into that, this is the second part of my question is when you have to put that who do you sound like? Um, so when I do sing, I think the two people that probably the closest as far as me singing is Lenny Kravitz and Prince. Um, then, but music wise, it's a very different sound. You know, when I'm playing, you know, ukulele, it's ukulele, so it's a very different sound. So I'm just wondering, should I go on what I'm singing, singing, or should I go on the the music all together? And if it's all together, the only closest person right now that people have said it reminds them of, and I think it's just because of the positivity and inspiration of my music, is Michael Franti, if you guys know that artist, who's an amazing artist. Anyway, love what you guys do. Thank you, and look forward to hearing what you got to say. La. Hey, how's it going? I, I definitely remember meeting him at the conference. Yeah, I, I was trying to remember what he looked like. I, I met so many people at the conference that it's they all kind of morph in my brain as to who's who. <laughs> Unless well, I'm following them on Instagram or something. But that, I had, that was a great question. Yeah, well, I have a couple uh, quick thoughts. If he's asking in terms of how to describe himself for the purposes of making that impact on potential audiences. I think it's pretty simple. Like I liked the description of Lenny Kravitz meets Michael Franti. Like, I think you have it all there. It's like positivity. Michael Franti is slightly beach vibesy, right? But not totally. But then with the Lenny Kravitz, you get more of the rock soul. And yeah. I think that's, per but if you're talking about running ads and uh, then I think there's two options you should probably test at the same time. And one is, that all of the ways in which you're very niche, I think could serve you in a, in a, in a good way because your audience will be uh, refined by which I mean like segmented down to a group of people who like, you know, start with people who like Lenny Kravitz and Prince and then go to the next level down in the ads manager or whatever tool you're using and saying, but they also must like Michael Franti. And then suddenly that work is done for you. And if you want, you could go yet another layer and say 35 and up or whatever you feel like your age demographic, you know? So that's one way. And then the other is to just do that thing that a lot of people are doing now and set no targeting at all and let Facebook or meta figure it out, which I've been hearing they're really, really good at these days. And you set no interest targeting, no, you know, maybe choose the countries you want to advertise in. But like beyond that, let Facebook figure it out. Yeah, I think this question is a very interesting one. And I think it's one that artists are constantly asking themselves, like, who is our audience? I think this is almost like two, two parter. Who is my audience and how do I? market myself to them or identify myself in a way that they understand I'm, I'm their person. Um, and it, the first part of his question made me think about our 
uh, authentic branding boot camp where he even does almost did one of the steps where it's like thinking of some famous artists now thinking of a lesser known artist and then coming up with uh, you know in his case it's um, if Lenny Kravitz and what was the Michael Franti Michael Franti uh, I know Tori's in Hawaii uh, had a Hawaiian love child playing uk ukulele this would be it. you know something like that right and you're thinking about that this is where you could uh ask the ai chatbot how to um categorize that or take that in and turn it into something interesting and riff on it a little bit but it's the idea of really what you're trying to do in some cases is you're just trying to give people a point of reference so if this is to like how do you describe your music i think what you're trying to do is take somebody that is pretty well known like a household name take somebody that is down more a few layers into what you do so it's a deeper connection and then then draw some connections between those and so it adds some intrigue and instant recognition um if you're trying to do like like you're talking about advertising i may take a different approach like you're saying that um you may want to get very specific um but the idea when you're trying to just like say who you sound like, really, you're just trying to help give people a point of reference so they understand like the average person who's, you know, not a musician, just living their life, might like some music. They don't know a million artists names. They don't know all these different subgenres. They just say something that helps them understand, oh, are you rock? Are you pop? Are you hip hop? Are you country? Give me some sort of frame of reference. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, it's funny. He, I feel like he is just one step away from the um, the the authentic branding bootcamp. Like I said, uh, methodology. You got the yeah. two sounds like artists. Prince is a legend, so start there. Or you know, Lenny Kravitz is famous. Yeah, Michael Franti is sort of what you know known, but not super well known. I didn't know that name. But... Um, and then yeah, throw in something about Hawaii or ukulele or something about the vibe or purpose of the music, and I think your job is done. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm working with an artist and she gets so frustrated because people in a certain age group always say, oh, you remind me of Jewel. She sounds nothing like <laughs> Jewel. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Uh, two women playing guitar. The, that's the comparison ends there. <laughs> and and uh, but I was telling her people do that because that's the only they're not musicians. They're not in the music space. They just remembering the one female artist that they could remember that played acoustic guitar. And that happened to be it, you know? Yep. So it's not, it's not an indictment on your music or a judgment on who you are as an artist. It's really just, they're just trying to provide some sort of frame of reference. And, and that's really it. Yeah. All right. Well, again, if you have thoughts or comments or questions and you want to call into the podcast, you can do so at 360-524-2209 or you can email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. I want to know your thoughts on music and AI, where you think it's going. Are you excited? Are you terrified? Um, is this really that point in the matrix where the <laughs> machines come and we battle it out and we all go underground where real music can still happen? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see any dance parties in the uh, Matrix. The, the robot seemed pretty dark and sad. Yeah, what the heck? I'm trying to think of other... Uh, well, you, you should watch Black Mirror. All right. It's um, it's like a, a very near dystopia. It's not 100 years away. It's like, oh, every episode's like, oh, that could be five years from now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's some serious <laughs> doom and gloom stuff on <laughs> on YouTube where they're like, this is going to happen so fast that you won't even know what hits you. I mean, there's, there's people that are, that are that concerned that a lot of with those privacy issues and how you can mimic other people and what's real anymore and, um, and all that. So we'll see, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the worst the world gets, it just makes artists write more songs, <laughs> <laughs> just get more depressed, right? Songs. <laughs> oh, that's not, that's not the intended outcome depression no nope but here here's chat gpt's warnings what does it say while we have safeguards in place the system may occasionally generate incorrect or misleading information and produce offensive or biased content 
it is not intended to give advice. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, like the daily horoscope or asking chat GPT, <laughs> what, what will I, I do with to, my life today? Give me the exact steps I will take to <laughs> go through my day and I will do them. And we will see if I, to be a successful human being and see what it says. Uh, anyway. All right. Well, um, I think it'll be interesting to see what artists come up with and what they are thinking about it. So I look forward to that. Yeah. And until then, um, I guess that's going to do it. We'll catch you next time. See you signing then. off the real Chris and the real Kevin are signing off. <laughs> this is, this has not been chat bots. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>